Welcome everybody to my series on probability and statistics. Today we'll be talking about some basic counting formulas. I am Dr. Lathram and you can usually find me living in the Department of Mathematics at Missouri Southern State University. So let's get started with today's lecture. So let's start off with a theorem that counts the Cartesian product of two finite sets. So suppose we've got sets E1 and E2 and the cardinality of E1 is going to be M and the cardinality of E2 is going to be N. Then the cardinality of the Cartesian product of E1 and E2 is M times N. So let's see if we can prove that. So let's start off by defining an onto map pi sub 1 mapping E sub 1 cross E sub 2 into E sub 2 such that pi sub 1 of the ordered pair AB is just A. So pi 1 is sometimes called the projection map. So pi sub 1 because I'm taking the projection onto the first coordinate of the ordered pair. So now for each A in E1 I'm going to consider the set the preimage under pi sub 1 of A. So I'm looking for all of the ordered pairs x, y, and E1 cross E2 such that pi sub 1 of x, y is equal to A. So basically that x is going to be equal to A. Now this gives us a bijection from f sub a from e2 into the preimage such that in a natural way f sub a of b is going to be equal to the ordered pair a b. So what this tells us is that because f sub a is a bijection that the cardinality of e2 is equal to the cardinality of the preimage and that is n by assumption. Since a was arbitrary, so a was just an arbitrary element of e sub 1, this is going to hold for any element in e sub 1. Now the inverse images partition e1 cross e2. So what that means is that the union of all of our preimages is equal to E1 cross E2. But also when we say that it partitions E1, E2 into these um, pre-images, the pre-images don't overlap so there's no, no, all of the pairwise intersections are empty. And so what that means is that if we add up all of the cardinalities of the pre-image sets then we get the total cardinality of E1 cross E2. Now what we've just done, the cardinality of each pre-image set is going to be N and we've got a correspondence, so we've got one pre-image set for every element that we have in E1 and so we're adding up N a total of M times which gives us a cardinality of N times M. So now this is really the idea behind the basic counting principle. So if we've got an experiment E sub 1 and that experiment has M possible outcomes and an experiment E sub 2 that has N possible outcomes then if we do the two experiments back to back so we perform an experiment E in which we first do E1 and then we do E2 the total number of outcomes for our experiment E is M times N. So why is that going to be true? Well, the proof is basically this. We may write the sample space of E, so all the set of all possible outcomes of E as just being ordered pairs where the first entry is the one of the outcomes from E1 and the second ordered pair, the second element in the ordered pair is an outcome from E2. And so that lists all possible outcomes that we can have as E and since this is really just the Cartesian product of E1 and E2 
from what we've just done in the previous theorem, it then follows that the cardinality of E is just M times N. So, let's talk about permutations. So, what exactly is a permutation? Well, the definition is an ordered arrangement of R distinct objects is called a permutation. So if we've got a set that has our distinct objects in it, how many different ways can we form a permutation? Well, that is actually given by this formula. So given our distinct objects, the total number of permutations, so the total number of distinct orderings, um, is denoted R with this exclamation point, and we actually say that as R factorial. And the formula for calculating that is going to be r times r minus 1 times r minus 2 times r minus 3 all the way down to 2 times 1. So let's see if we can prove that particular formula. So we'll actually do this proof by induction. So now it's a, always a good time to remember your proof by induction. So suppose we start off with r being 1. Then by the formula, we have 1 factorial is equal to 1. And sure enough, if you've only got one object, how can you arrange the number of ways that you can arrange one object? Well, there's only one way to do that. So our formula holds for the case r is equal to 1. So now we'll make an induction hypothesis that we assume that r, that the formula holds um, up to R factorial. So then with our induction, proof by induction, for the induction step, suppose we have R plus one distinct things. Okay. Then we're going to break this up into two separate experiments. The first experiment in which we select the first element. So um, if we form a permutation by selecting the first element, um, we've got r plus one things. We're choosing one of them. Well, there's only r plus one ways of choosing the first element. So for the second experiment, we're going to arrange the remaining R distinct objects. So the first experiment, we arrange, we picked the first object. And for the second experiment, we're going to arrange the final objects. Well, by our induction hypothesis, we know that there are R factorial ways to do that. And so what that gives us, by the basic counting principle that we just proved, if we've got R plus one ways of performing the first experiment, R factorial ways of performing the second experiment, if we do the experiments back to back, so we're arranging R plus one objects, then the number of possible ways of doing that is the product of R plus one times R factorial, or R plus one factorial. And so by the principle of math induction, this is going to hold for all positive integers So we've got a couple of important consequences for now being able to count the number of orderings of objects. The first one, suppose that we're given a collection of n distinct objects, but we don't want to order all of them. We want to only order some of them. So we want to order our objects from the n objects that we were given. Well, the number of ways of doing this is given by p super r su super n sub r and that will be n factorial divided by n minus r factorial. So suppose that you're given um, five objects and you only want to order three of them. So you want to choose three of them and then you want to order them. How many ways can you actually do that? Well, let's see if we can derive how that formula works. So the first one, we'll start off by, we know that if we start off with n objects, then we can order them in n factorial ways. And so suppose that we take an ordering, a1, a2, da 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 da, all the way up to a sub r, a sub r plus 1, a sub r plus 2, all the way up to a sub n. 
Now we're only interested in the first R elements. And so what we'll do is we'll take all possible n factorial orderings and we're going to group them into packets. And we're going to group them into packets based on whether the first R elements are the same. And so if the first R elements are the same, then the remaining elements in each packet, the remaining elements in each ordering, we don't really care about. And so what that means is that we've got a total of n minus r factorial arrangements of the remaining objects. And so what we've done, we've taken a total of n factorial things and we've grouped those things into packets and each packet has n minus r factorial things in it. And so what that means is that the number of packets we have, um, which is the number of r objects taken from a collection of n objects, um, is going to be given by n factorial divided by n minus r factorial. And sure enough this gives us our counting formula. So now the second counting formula that we'll get a lot of use out of are counting combinations. So what do we mean by a combination? Well, a combination, um, given a collection of n distinct objects, then we want to know the number of ways of, that we can select r of the objects. And here's the kicker, we don't care what order that we're actually choosing these things. So how many ways is it possible to choose um, r things from a collection of n things? And that formula is given by n factorial divided by r factorial times n minus r factorial. So let's see where this formula comes from. So we'll start off where we left off with the previous one in that we've taken all possible n factorial orderings and we've grouped them together based on the first R objects. So if the first R objects are the same, they go into the same bucket. Now we know how many collections, so we know how many buckets we have from this first ordering. We have n factorial divided by n minus R factorial. So we want to group these collections into bigger collections. So now kind of imagine we've taken all of these n factorial orderings, we've put some of them in buckets based on the first r objects, and now we want to take these buckets and put, it, put them in a larger container, maybe a crate or something. So we're taking some of the buckets and putting them into a, a crate based on whether or not the first r entries have the same letters. So we don't care about the ordering of the letters, we just want to know that the first R letters are the same. So this is where we're counting the order not mattering part. So how many ways do we have of arranging R objects? Well, we know that we have a total of R factorial ways in which to arrange them into this putting our buckets into the crates. And so what do we have? We've got um, n factorial over n minus r factorial objects. Um, so these are our number of buckets and we're putting r factorial buckets into a particular crate. So how many crates are we going to need? That's our n choose r. We're going to need n factorial divided by r factorial n minus r factorial crates of doing so these numbers, um, I've already kind of called them n choose r, these are called binomial coefficients. And sometimes you actually see people refer to them as n choose r. So the number of ways of choosing r things given a collection of n things when you don't care about the order in which you're choosing them. So one place that the binomial coefficients show up is in Pascal's triangle. So if you've not seen Pascal's triangle, it's a pretty neat thing. The idea is you start off with this triangle with just a one, and then you put ones on the outside edge of each row. 
So one goes there, one goes there, but then when you need a number in between, what you will do is you will add the two elements that are diagonally above it. So one plus one is going to give you two. So I put for the next row, I put one on the outside, one on the outside, and then for the elements in the middle, one plus two gives me three. Two plus one is going to give me three, and so I get one, three, three, one. For the next level, I have one on the outside, one on the outside, one plus three is going to give me four. 3 plus 3 is going to give me 6, and 3 plus 1 is going to give me 4, and so on and so on. And so I develop this triangle. Now as it turns out, our binomial coefficients follow exactly the same relation. That if we pick two particular elements, so let's say that we pick an element here, so this this is our n choose n minus one choose r minus one. So we're choosing this element, and then we're adding the next element to it. So n minus one choose r. So we're taking this element, and we're adding it together to give this element. Then we're getting the next element in the row, which is the n choose R. Now, so this is kind of a geometric way of, of describing the binomial coefficients. But we've also got some a place where it pops up kind of algebraically. Algebraically, it f comes from the binomial theorem. So if we look at x plus y to the nth power, then if we multiply all that out, then it turns out that the numbers that show up in front of our polynomial terms will be these binomial coefficients. So the binomial coefficients kind of give us a way of counting these particular terms. And so if we just play around with the binomial theorem, we see sure enough that x plus y to the zero power is one, so that's our first row of Pascal's triangle. X plus y to the first power is just x plus y, so we have coefficient one, coefficient one, x plus y squared gives us x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. x plus y cubed, x squared plus 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y cubed, 1, 3, 3, 1. x plus y to the fourth, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. x plus y to the fifth, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. And even x plus y to the sixth, 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, and 1. So sure enough, just playing with our binomial theorem, we end up with the coefficients. We end up with our binomial coefficients and the elements of Pascal's triangle. And so a really good question is, well, why on earth does that work? Well, the idea is basically this. Suppose we start out with n objects. And from those n objects, we're going to form two buckets. Let's say we've got an x bucket and we've got a y bucket. Then what we're going to do is just pick some of these elements. So we're going to throw that one in the x bucket, throw that one in the x bucket, throw this one in the x bucket, throw this one in the y bucket, and in the y bucket, so that nobody gets missed. Everybody ends up in one of these buckets. Now, over in the x bucket, we've got a total of k objects. And so since everybody else is over in the y bucket, we've got n minus k objects in the y bucket. What this really corresponds to in our binomial um, theorem is the term x to the k, y to the n minus k. The x is talking about the x bucket, and it's got a total of k items in it. The y corresponds to the y bucket, and it's got n minus k items in it. And so our coefficient ends up being the number of ways that we can make these particular arrangements of k elements in the x bucket and minus k elements in the y bucket. 
All right, so that lets us generalize. So we generalize this even more. Why do we have to restrict ourselves to only two buckets? So again, we're starting off with n objects. From those n objects, suppose we want three buckets now. We've got an x bucket, a y bucket, and a z bucket. When we do the same thing, we pick out some elements, throw them in the x bucket, pick out a few more elements, throw them in the y bucket, and then everything that's left over gets dumped in the z bucket. So in the x bucket, we've got n sub 1 objects. In the y bucket, we've got n sub 2 objects. And in the z bucket, we've got n sub 3 objects. But the thing is, all of these objects has to have to end up in one particular bucket. So n sub 1 plus n sub 2 plus n sub 3 has to be our total number of objects n. Well, what this turns out to be is if we look at the expansion of x plus y plus z raised to the n power, we get these terms that x to the n sub 1, y to the n sub 2, z to the n sub 3, these are corresponding to our buckets x, y, and z. The n sub 1, n sub 2, n sub 3 are the number of elements that we've got in each bucket. And so if we look at the coefficient, once we do this big expansion, that coefficient is the number of ways that we can throw these objects into these buckets with n sub 1 elements in the first op in the first bucket, n sub 2 elements in the y bucket, and n sub 3 elements in the z bucket. So this is exactly the idea behind the multinomial coefficients. What it represents are the number of ways that we can divide a set of n distinct objects into k buckets, and we want the cardinality of each bucket being n sub 1, n sub 2, all the way up to n sub k. Well, what's the formula for actually doing this? Well, the number of ways of partitioning n distinct objects into k distinct sets, each set containing n sub 1, n sub 2, up to n sub k objects, is this formula, it looks pretty similar to the binomial coefficients. We've got n factorial divided by n sub 1 factorial, n sub 2 factorial, all the way up to n sub k factorial. On the condition that if we add all of the n sub 1, n sub 2, all the way up to n sub k together, we get all of our n objects back. And so how do we come up with this formula? How do we see that this actually works? <clears throat> Well, the idea is to do is to divide this experiment up into k smaller experiments. So we can think of the first experiment as we've got n objects, and we want to choose n sub 1 of them. Well, how do we do that? Well, we've got the binomial coefficient. It tells us how to do that. We've got n choose n sub 1, and that's going to be n factorial over n sub 1 factorial, n minus n sub 1 factorial. Well, for the second experiment, we're going to choose n sub 2 elements from the remaining n minus 1 elements. Well, again, we know how to do that. We've got the binomial coefficient. That's just n minus n sub 1 choose n sub 2. What is that? n minus n sub 1 factorial over n sub 2 factorial times n minus n sub 1 minus n sub 2 factorial. So we can just kind of keep this going. We get down to the rth experiment. We're choosing n sub r objects from n minus all of the objects that we've chosen up to this point. And so what is that? Well, it's going to be a binomial coefficient. It's going to have that kind of form to it. But because we're doing each one of these experiments success successively, what does the basic counting principle tell us? It tells us that our total number of outcomes is going to be given by the product of the number of outcomes of each of one of the smaller experiments. So these values that we're getting, we've got n factorial over n sub 1 factorial, n minus n sub 1 factorial, times n minus n sub 1 factorial over n sub 2 factorial, n minus n sub 1 minus n sub 2 factorial. So notice that what happens here, these terms cancel out. 
So my n minus 1 factorial cancels out with that n sub minus 1 factorial. And in the next term, this n minus n sub 1 minus n sub 2 is going to cancel with it in the numerator in the next term. And so I get this successive canceling until my final expression is going to have n factorial over n sub 1, n sub 2 factorial, da 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 da, n sub k factorial times n minus that expression. Well, okay. But because we have n minus n is equal to the sum of those, then this n minus the sum of those is going to be 0 factorial. But 0 factorial is going to be 1. And so what that leaves us with, the total number of partitions of the set in the size n sub 1, n sub 2, all the way up to n sub k, is n factorial over the product of the factorials of the cardinalities of our subsets. Pretty cool. So if we've got a binomial theorem corresponding to the binomial coefficients, then we ought to have a multinomial theorem corresponding to the multinomial coefficients. Sure enough, we do. So the multinomial theorem says that for any positive integer m and any non-negative integer n, if we have x sub 1 plus x sub 2 da, 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 up to x sub m raised to the nth power, then that's going to be a sum of these terms, x sub 1 to some power, x sub 2 to some power, x sub 3 to some power, and the coefficients that show up in that expansion are our multinomial coefficients. So multinomial theorem is pretty cool, it's pretty handy, it can come in handy in some cases. We'll actually see it coming up again in some other videos. But if you want more information about it, you want to take a look at some things, I'll point you to the Wikipedia page on the multinomial theorem. Well, that's it for today. See you guys later.